Jacob Lieberman was born in 1802 in Severn, a small town in Alsace, which raised a monument to his memory in the town center and which gave his name to one of its streets. His father was a rabbi. He thus received a solid Jewish education based on the Bible and the Torah. He lost his mother when he was only 11 years old. His father wished him to become a rabbi also. Throughout his youth, he only spoke Yiddish. When he was 20 years old, his father sent him to study in the Jewish seminary in Mitz, the capital of Lorraine. The seminary was situated in the street now called Rabbi Eli Block Street. But he did not want to become a rabbi. He learned French and Latin without telling his father. He was struck by the conversion of his elder brother, Samson, who became a Catholic. He arrived in Paris in 1824 and stayed at the College St. Stanislaus, where he also was converted. He described his conversion as follows. Remembering the God of my fathers, I fell on my knees and beseeched him to make clear to me the true religion. Immediately it was made clear to me. I saw the truth. Faith penetrated my mind and my heart. When he was baptized, he chose the names of Francois Marie Paul. He wanted to become a priest and enter the seminary of St. Sulpice, but he became ill. Despite his illness, epilepsy, he became a valued counselor to the seminarians at issy les In 1837, he was taken on as master of the novices by the Erdis congregation at Rennes. Rennes is the capital of Brittany and the birthplace of Claude Poulard de Plas, founder of the Spiritans. Seminary friends, especially Frédéric Le Vévesseur from Réunion and Eugène Tesserand of Haitian origin, he asked to help found a group devoted to the evangelization of the blacks. Finally, Lieberman agreed to help his friends and went to Rome in 1840 to have a plan approved by the church. The name chosen for the new group was the Society of Missionaries of the Holy Heart of Mary. Here we are, just a few meters from the building where Lieberman lived, in the Via del Penetro, off the Piazza San Agostino. Here we find this church, where Lieberman tells us he used to come practically every day. The San Agostino church was, in fact, quite near the Piazza Navona and his residence in the Piazza of the Five Moons, Lieberman also visited other sanctuaries in Rome, especially St. Peter's Basilica. Durant son année à Rome, donc Lieberman est souvent venu. During his year in Rome, Lieberman often came to St. Peter's Basilica. He speaks of it at length in one of his April letters to his brother, Dr. Samson. He tells him how he was astonished by the huge size of the basilica. He tells him, I went around on foot and it took me 11 minutes to do. Then he speaks of the magnificent interior of St. Peter's, of its side chapels as big as a cathedral at home. But the most interesting and moving thing is what he calls the Confessions of St. Peter. When he arrives here, he says to his brother, it's extraordinary what the world has done for the tomb of these two poor Jews. He, a Jew himself, Jacob Lieberman, writing to his Jewish brother Samson, who was also converted to Christ of the Confession of St. Peter, thinking not simply about the first of the apostles, but thinking immediately about the tomb of two poor Jews even though St. Paul is obviously not buried at St. Peter's. But Lieberman never separates Peter and Paul in his writings, especially during his stay in Rome. His plan was finally approved in June of 1840 by the Vatican. They were responsible for the missions, then called Propaganda. Nous sommes ici sur la place d'Espagne et c'est sur cette place que se trouve donc derrière moi 
Here we are at the Piazza di Spagna, and it's here behind me that the Palace of the Propagation of the Faith, Propaganda Fidi, is situated. It obviously is an extremely important building for Lieberman because that's the site of Propaganda, where he wants to present his missionary plan. Here also are the offices of Cardinal Franzoni, of Monsignor Casolini, the secretary, whom he is going to meet. And it's there also where his friend, Monsieur Drac works, who was his godfather at his baptism. Monsieur Drac is propaganda's librarian in these buildings. De la propagande dans ces bâtiments. As his health improved, he returned to France to study at the Strasbourg Seminary, where he was ordained deacon. But it was in the chapel of the Bishop of Amiens that he was ordained priest on September 18, 1841. Because his group found a house which was in the district known as Le Neuville, the house no longer exists. Here now there is instead a residence for the elderly. That is where the first missionaries of the Holy Heart of Mary got their formation. But as the group grew quickly, Lieberman added another place, 28 kilometers from Imins, called Notre Dame de God for theological formation. The group grew rapidly. Despite difficulties, many missionaries died at quite a young age on the African coast because of tropical diseases. His first two companions, Tisserand and Levavasseur, left on mission, the former to Haiti, the second to the island of Bibon, now called Reunion. He linked his congregation with the Congregation of the Holy Spirit, founded in 1703 by Claude Poulet de Place, which had almost the same aims as his own. He then took up residence in 30 Rue Le Mont, which was formerly called the Rue des Postes. He brought about this fusion so as to better organize missions in Africa and America. The seminaries at Le Nivelle and Notre Dame de Gord came to join him shortly afterwards. Lieberman was original in many ways. He wasn't able to go to Africa because of his fragile health, but he understood the needs of mission in Africa. He was even much ahead of his time, for he was already proposing, in 1846, the creation of the African diocese with African bishops and priests in charge. He also understood the need for development, for, as well as priests, he had brothers specializing in various trades who were able to teach Africans woodwork, carpentry, agriculture, stock rearing. Brother Mark Tirant, a trained doctor and former missionary in Pakistan tells us about it. C'est un très bon nom, frère. C'est un mot horizontal. Brother is a very fine name. It's a horizontal word which links people, placing them on the same level. It is really part of our congregation's origin. When you visit Africa, in the cemeteries where you will find the first spirit in teams, whether it be at Bagamoyo in Tanzania, in Nairobi in Kenya, at Bafa in Guinea, you'll notice that in these first communities, there are brothers and priests in equal measure. Why? Because Lieberman's idea had been understood. This idea that to be successful in mission, there was a need for diversity, diversity in commitments, in ways of living, in training, in experience, diversity in the services one can give the mission. He had a very modern vision of the role of missionaries, and he asked them to strip themselves of Europe in order to make themselves Negroes with the Negroes. Listen to what two African Spiritans had to say about this. For us, the Africans, Lieberman remains a great figure who has marked for us Africans, Lieberman remains a great figure who has left his mark on the church and mission in Africa. Lieberman's position in regard to Africa is fixed. From 1846, in his whole plan for evangelization of black Africa, and he dares to affirm at a time when there was racism everywhere that Africans are good-natured and not less intelligent than other peoples. I find that this is terrific. Next, he clarifies how he sees African evangelization. Comment il voyait l'évangélisation en Afrique? D'abord, il faut former 
un clergé local. First, you must train a local clergy and then catechists so that the local churches become self-governing. He wanted autonomy for local churches. Next, develop educational works and social works. And finally, and above all, have a positive attitude towards African cultures. Il faut une attitude positive vis-à-vis -vis des cultures africaines. And if I had to clarify this positive attitude, I would say this. If the gospel is to produce a local autonomous church, the gospel must root itself in the mentality and culture of the people and not in a culture of missionary origin. Dans la culture d'origine du missionnaire. Lieberman a eu un cœur ouvert pour les Africains. Lieberman had a heart open to Africans. At the end of his life, he said, my heart is with the Africans. He's not only thought about them, but he also sent missionaries to Africa. I am the result of those missionaries who came to the Central African Republic to announce the good news of salvation. Today, as a cardinal, I can say that commitment to the poor Commitment to the deprived is a reality which has its source through Lieberman, in Christ himself, because those who are abandoned are those who have a privileged place in the heart of God, in the heart of Lieberman. More than ever, commitment to the impoverished must be a priority for me and for us spiritans. devait être une priorité pour moi et pour nous spiritans. Lieberman is also a great spiritual master, as Father Yves Marie Fade, a former missionary in Senegal, tells us. Le Père Lieberman est un grand maître spirituel. Il nous enseigne tout particulièrement la docilité à l'Esprit Saint. Father Lieberman is a great spiritual master. He teaches us especially docility to the Holy Spirit. But what Lieberman taught, he first lived out profoundly himself. And I would like to mention three main events where he lived in the Holy Spirit, experienced the Spirit, and which filled his teaching later. There was the moment he arrived in Paris. He was at the College Stanislas, and Monsieur Droc brought him to a little cell where there was hardly any skylight for light. And there, full of melancholy, far from his family, having seen the joy of his brother Samson, who had converted to Christ, he felt a great sadness. He threw himself on his knees and begged the God of his ancestors. If the belief of Christians is true, I ask you to let me know that. If it is false, keep me far from it. And Lieberman testifies, immediately I was enlightened. I saw the light, faith filled my mind and my heart, and I adhered easily firmly to all that was told about the life and death of Jesus Christ and the mystery of the Eucharist did not trouble me at all. I believed it all without difficulty. The second experience was on his baptismal day, 24 December, 1826. He speaks about it seven years later. Whenever the water flowed onto my forehead, it seemed to me that I was an immense globe of fire. I no longer lived a natural life. I no longer saw anything. I no longer heard what was happening around me. Things happened in me that are impossible to describe. The third experience that was special for him, he lived for about five years, a period of great spiritual graces. The Holy Spirit led him to a profound union with the Lord, with the Holy Trinity. And that is why Lieberman later taught us what he calls practical union. This is an attitude of docility to the Holy Spirit who lives in our hearts and who leads us to a permanent way, more or less unknowingly, into the presence of the Holy Spirit. À l'Esprit Saint qui habite dans nos cœurs et qui nous conduit de manière permanente, inconsciente, plus ou moins consciente, à la présence de l'Esprit Saint. Lieberman died in his office on the 2nd of February, 1852, and one of his friends, Monsignor Gaston de Segur, sketched his portrait on his deathbed, 
because he considered him already to be a saint. Now the fathers and brothers of the Holy Spirit work in 60 countries on all continents. They are also helped by lay associates practicing different occupations. They even found new missions, for, as for example in India and in Bolivia. They number almost 3,000 and are happy to serve the poor, as Father Lieberman had asked them to do.